So let us begin. It works great. I am the editor-in-chief of the Internet Publishing House, and uh, I am at the last uh, link in this food chain, actually, because right now we are facing a super ambitious goal within the next 15 minutes uh, to talk about what it means, uh, scientific research in education as uh, a development of the digital economy and economy of knowledge. It's difficult to even pronounce that, and it's difficult to discuss all that within the next 50 minutes. But anyway, we will try doing this together with our wonderful guests. So, dear colleagues, take your seats, please. Ivan Yashenko, please take your seat. Ivan Yashenko, the director of the Pedagogical Excellence uh, Institute, Mr. Fruman, head of the High School of Economics. Marco and Natalia have already introduced themselves. And together with us, so we have uh, Viktor Mikhailovich, uh, the director of MGPU, as well as Yuri Zinchenko, the head of the Russian Academy of Sciences. So, let us start by thinking what education is about, what is pedagogy is about, uh, teaching, what is it about? Because when we just look at it uh, as a layman from the side, people believe that teaching is uh, something which can't be anticipated or focused and which, hardly, which can hardly be measurable by any scientific tools. But actually, this is not the case. And recently, there are a lot of surveys in education, including in Russia. And I think that you know this very well, that there are a lot of government programs for supporting education. And we even have uh, a national educational project in Russia. So let us begin by understanding at what point we are, what we have now, and what we are trying to measure. And uh, we are looking for new technologies. Are we studying people, or are we studying education? I believe that those who know about this subject can take the mic. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I think that's very important. I believe there should be more of us participating in the conference. And the main situation is that we are in the habit of asking at what point we are. And there is a kind of uncertainty which helps us understand that we are not at a particular point, but maybe at the vicinity of this point, maybe in some kind of corridor. As for educational research, of course, sometimes uh, some other specialists in uh, physics, uh, biology, and other scientists uh, are not really sure that there could be, could be any fundamental research in education. But, my colleagues, I will tell you that every science has its object of study. Physics, for example, studies electrons. There are electrons which are studied in Grenoble, in the uh, Collider, in Switzerland and in France. Uh, and uh, this electron is the same in Moscow and in Paris from the point of view of the researchers. But when we go into the humanitarian sciences, this simple hypothesis that all the objects are absolutely the same, it alone is a great challenge for the science. 
Our children and uh, ourselves are not electrons. Uh, we don't have just one negative charge, and that's it. Each of us has a lot of characteristics as a person. So I go back to the fact that uh, research in the humanitarians, in humanitarian sciences uh, and teaching are much more difficult in terms of uh, the number of things we need to take into account. Uh, we need to take uh, into account the age of a person, because an electron doesn't have any age. We also need to take uh, into account the social situation, the situation that we have during the teaching, and many other factors that we could neglect in other sciences. And uh, this is the particular feature of this subject. And our subject is also an object, uh, unlike the electron. Uh, actually, it's a person, not, not just an object. So this person has uh, a rich personality, unlike an electron. Going back to the teaching, why do we need all that? When we talk about our targets, we have to mention first the need to improve the quality of education. On the other hand, we need to use control tools. And you do remember the principle of uncertainty. Sometimes uh, we know the location of the electron, but we can't um, determine its speed, uh, or vice versa. There's the same problem with education. When we think too much about quality control, the whole procedure, we forget very often that before controlling something, you need to spend enough time on the content, on getting information about our child. So the child should first know, should first learn how to learn, how to study. That's the main competence for the child's future. On the other hand, we have this control function all this time. And sometimes uh, there is criticism about uh, the single state exam in Russia, EGE. Uh, and um, maybe some of this criticism is due to the fact that we are thinking about control. We want to show some pretty figures, but we are not interested in the educational process itself. So there should be a balance between control and uh, the, re the actual learning, getting quality education. And we do not uh, see this much uh, in Russia. And I have a, a logical question probably to you, Isaac Davidovich. We all know that we've been studying the development of a pedagogy for quite a while, and there was the program for improving education uh, dating from 2016, which uh, was also about improving education, forecasting the quality of education. So since then, since 2016, did we make any progress? And since 2012, for example, is it have we have we made much progress since 2012? How do we study education in terms of time? How much time do we need to draw conclusions, for example? That's a very good question. To continue on what Yuri Petrovich said about the difficulty of the object. We have children in education. We have children who are studying, who are much more difficult than ele an electron. And Vladimir Lenin actually said that the electron is as inexhaustible as an atom. But, well, we'll leave that aside. But when we talk about education, we talk we don't talk about individual learning. And here there is a special relationship between psychologists and teachers, because many presentations to be heard here will be about lab studies, about how a person gets education. And that's very important. 
but education is a huge social ecosystem with different levels and um, students do not learn there individually. As one of my colleagues said, education is a system of um, undetermined complexity. So when we study education, actually those studies started quite recently. While the process of learning itself was a subject of discussion, research, philosophical discussion anyway, starting from Plato, but uh, there has been the survey, the, the scientific research of this for about 100 years, but studying education is a very recent thing because we have had very few empirical data about that which is why we are in the very early stage of studying the educational system or education as a cultural and social institution. And one of the greatest challenges is the connection between learning sciences and the science of education. And there's also your second question about the time scale. Of course, studying education. There's the same difference as, for example, between studying the density of a mineral. Well, you knock this mineral with a hammer. You can have some simple lab stories involved there. And you do this on one time scale. But, but geologists who work on a different time scale, they can't tell you how the planet changed within the last 10 or 20 or 100 years. So we don't really know what happened with education since 2012. We can see some changes since 2012, but we will learn what has happened with the quality of education in about 20 years. So. When I ask you what uh, the year of our educational policy is, I answer 2030, because it is in 2030 that our current school children will finish school, those children who are coming to school now. These are the cycles we have, and that's a great challenge of um, bringing forward uh, the psychology of development into practice of education. And here I'm forced to add something. There's a terrible word combination which we repeat all too often. That's digitalization of uh, the society and uh, the parallel digitalization of education. So we don't actually know anything. It's by 2030 that we will have some understanding. But we are told that with the help of the science, we need to adapt our education to the current changing digitalized uh, environment. And here we have a question to Mark. What is this uh, change in the digital environment? How will it affect uh, education? Let's talk about international research. Do we have uh, any fundamental international survey of how education should uh, uh, change as it, becoming, it is becoming digitalized? I had to wait till I heard the question. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no problem. So mathematics education and technology is a very interesting combination because in a way that's very universal. The mathematics is taught almost the same way across the world and the technology is universally shared, the same tools and same software is used. And then we come to what Yuri was telling that education is very contextual. It's very much embedded in, in the local traditions and, the, and it's influenced by the language and, and the social setting. So that gives a very interesting research opportunity to see how the same technology to teach the same mathematics works differently in different contexts. 
and those things that are remaining the same, it's a very strong indication of universality, universality in, in the outcomes. Um, there's lots of opportunities with the technology that are coming. For example, a very key thing in mathematics is the different representations and transformations between from one representation to another, from formal representation to graphical to verbal expression. And technology is providing new opportunities for presenting dynamically a live interactive situation about a mathematical idea, how to study about the derivative in, in an interactive way. And, and it's, it's shown in qualitative case studies that that influences the way people are understanding these new concepts. But it's still a long way before we can go to the more fundamental uh, answers about what is the universal benefit of technology in, in learning mathematics overall. So it starts with more local research, but we should be communicating with each other so that we can share and compare our local results to see what is universal across different contexts, uh, across different learners, across different ways of teaching. Thank you. Thank you. And I have this sensation that we are in the spaceship. We are at the starting point. Uh, we want to talk about what we have, but we don't actually know anything so far. And there was one key word at this conference, mathematics. I haven't pronounced this word yet, so I will correct my mistake. So let's try speaking about research in education and mathematics. We are trying to study technologies, results and processes. And Ivan Valerievich, I have a question to you. What should we do with the quality of mathematical education? What can the science give us? Because we know how much attention is given traditionally in Russia to mathematics. It is still one of the school priorities, and not only school priorities. Indeed, it's great that so much attention is paid to mathematics not only in Russia, but all over the world. And mathematical education is uh, having a paramount role in every country across the entire world as uh, a way to improve career prospects and improve the quality of life of every person because people start taking a lot of decisions and here we are in a situation of huge uncertainty. This is a buzzword today. And education is starting to change so quickly that all traditional approaches are not working yet. The traditional approach is to first to write the standards, uh, then testing them, then writing textbooks, and so on and so forth. But all of that is not working because uh, those processes uh, will become outdated before actually happening. So we should do everything quite quickly. On the other hand, education is such an interesting thing because uh, many things cannot be measured. Right now, you can get something away from school which you think is unimportant, and then you will remember that uh, butterfly which affected the whole world in some uh, science fiction story. On the other hand, digitalization is making life easier. We can see some rapid results before we need to test uh, things on small groups. But now it is becoming possible to um, just analyze uh, the results shown by children in real life situations uh, from digital diaries uh, and logs. Uh, and Russia is uh, very strong here. And it's great that we are here in Moscow because Moscow is already using those uh, digital tools. Uh, and it has results because everything we do when moving on from lab research 
to real life. And it's great that we have such a big group here which brings uh, science forward. But as soon as we move on to real school, we need to know everything which makes the life of a teacher easier, which makes the life of a student easier. Because the main resource that we have and that we are wasting in vain is the time of the child. Well, we can put money, we can provide the equipment, but we have a sacred thing. That's the lifetime of a child. And we don't really think about uh, the time of uh, the child. We give children a lot of homework, and we haven't even measured how much uh, children work. They, the children are working like workers in the 19th century. But if we spend this resource of a child efficiently so that the child really wants to do this, that's the main resource of improving the quality of education. As we've measured up to one half of math lessons uh, at high school are inefficient because uh, children are not ready yet. For example, a child cannot uh, push um, or pull himself up uh, at the PE lesson, and uh, th this child is asked to do some more difficult things. And uh, now the child is asked uh, to differentiate uh, the uh, multiplication of a function, but this child is not ready for that at all. So we need to have more profiles in mathematics uh, in the seventh uh, to the ninth form. And there are a lot of uh, psychologists uh, who will tell you that uh, profiling in the uh, primary school is uh, impossible and even harmful. But in high school, we need to separate children, children who are more inclined to mathematics uh, would be able to learn something more difficult. Those uh, who need just some basic mathematics could also have that. And there's another important thing that psychologists would tell us. And uh, unfortunately, that's a negative side of uh, many things involving mathematics education. We do a lot of things without taking into account the age specificities. We have a one-to-all approach. We understand that, for example, in figure skating, if a girl hasn't started doing something at six, she will not do anything later. But in math, a child might actually have problem with mathematics at an early stage, but might be great in mathematics at a later stage. So we don't need to hurry things up. It's okay if a child doesn't understand something. They will understand it later. So we need this individualization. And this concerns geometry, by the way, because uh, in terms of psychology, children develop their geometric vision at a different age. And our colleague psychologists can really help us with motivation, with the understanding of what mathematics education is about. And I would like uh, to warn the journalists here that uh, we should, we are talking about the development of a child, uh, but uh, as soon as uh, we think about how we measure the talent of a child when we start talking about physics, for example, or some advanced problems in physics or in math, when you differentiate a difficult function with uh, exponents, uh, it's really, really advanced. It's just another technical skill, actually. It's not the development of a child itself. So very often, People measure something different. People measure not the creative skills of a child, but they just uh, measure some technical skills. And as soon as some measurement tools are being optimized, they start working against themselves because uh, children become successful at one area, but then they fail in something else. So we change the paradigm at school. We stopped talking about gifted children. We say that each child is talented and we need to develop this talent. And it turned out that in mass 
Uh, it is uh, in the ordinary schools that children provide outstanding results, even in the regions. Thank you. And now I almost wept because my child goes uh, to a school with advanced maths, uh, and I had problems uh, with uh, homework because I'm a historian. I can't understand some math problems very well, and I had to help my uh, child with, with uh, the homework. But if you take an ordinary school parent in Moscow, for example, because Moscow is a separate region of Russia, it's uh, a story of its own. So when a child goes to a good school, usually there's a psychologist there who says, let us go and see a neuropsychologist because we have a very, uh, a lot of interesting data and we will help your child. And when I read the program of this conference, I was glad to see that there are many interesting presentations here which will tell us about knowledge from the point of view of uh, a person, and that would be very helpful for all of us. But what are we missing? Natasha, what are we... That's a question to you, I think. Uh, what are we missing? What could we learn more about scientific, about education as uh, scientific knowledge? Well, from the point of view of Yandex and uh, the products we are developing, I asked uh, the interview from Norma. Unfortunately, Norma fell ill, so the next presentation will be different from what we had uh, in this program, but it's also an interesting presentation. But Norma is looking into the psychology of mathematics education, and she said that the teacher is not just a source of knowledge, it's an organizer, a tutor, but uh, he is also a good, somebody who is good at uh, diagnosis. That is, uh, the teacher should understand why the child made a mistake, what to change for this child. There are about 400,000 uh, children who use Yandex textbooks. We can check where those children made a mistake, how often they make mistakes how much time they spend on homework. And we can tell the teachers uh, if uh, the homework is too big, maybe some children should have less homework and others should have more homework. But we can't really tell why the child made a mistake. Only the child, uh, only the teacher can see this. And if we have psychologists and neuropsychologists, we are lucky. It's not in every school that there is a neuropsychologist. I think there is a minority of such schools, maybe just Moscow. So we need the data about what is the reason of those difficulties so that teachers and psychologists can work with this, so that we can use this knowledge uh, to develop good practices for teachers, for school directors, for the parents who would understand where the problem is. For example, we looked uh, at a typical task uh, in uh, the beginning school and uh, children make 24 different types of mistakes. And we can see why the child made a mistake, because the child confuses left and right, because the child is uh, inattentive when reading the uh, problem. Maybe the child can't yet grasp the meaning of long texts. There are many reasons why a child could make a mistake. So the, even the technologies are struggling here, and we need to develop uh, more in this area. We need to have more research to understand how uh, a teacher can diagnose uh, these problems. And of course, it would be pointless to do anything without teachers. Because no matter how much big data we have, and how well we process this data, we still have this problem area because um, 
it's thanks to the teachers that, that the children can really be successful. And um, the question is whether the teachers are ready to adapt. So do we have any changes uh, in the pedagogical science, in pedagogical preparation? Who will go to schools as teachers in 2030, for example? That's a complex question. I also thought about who those people are. I would put it slightly different. I would uh, actually um, speak about how the pedagogical science is changing. And uh, I believe uh, that um, it moves on from the analysis of uh, what should be to the analysis of what there is. Uh, for example, even in the previous century, there was a teaching about what should be. For example, there were even books uh, about school science in the 1950s in the Soviet Union, probably. And in those books, every step of a teacher's work was described very thoroughly up to each centimeter, up to the number of centimeters between sinks in the toilet up to how you should start a conversation with the parents and so on. So the pedagogical science had this peak uh, of uh, conversations about what should be. And right now we are having a different situation. We are only starting to study what's really happening. So what is this Moscow Digital School about from the point of view of the teacher's work, not just from the point of view of accumulating data about uh, the children's progress, about their attendance rates, about what's written in their diaries. From the point of view of the teacher, it's the following. Those who worked uh, in the internet era at school had uh, notes of uh, lessons. They wrote the targets, objectives, uh, the educational goal of the lesson, the methods used, uh, what the teacher should start, uh, say at the beginning of the lesson, what homework the teacher should give, and so on. Those teachers who had a less strict uh, professors just had a list of uh, questions to be discussed with children, and they could um, choose between different scenarios of a lesson. So what has happened now? Right now, all those teachers' materials, though, which were the foundation for planning their lessons, uh, proved to be in one single environment, the Moscow Digital School. So. Right now, there are those who can see what each particular teacher has, what teachers take from each other, what they are based on, what lessons are pop more popular, what lessons are less popular. We have this big data, what the teachers um, base upon. There are a lot of resources on many internet websites like uchi.ru and what materials do teachers ignore deliberately and this is a huge space for analysis for us it's very interesting because when we ask what the content of teaching should be we should ask the teachers about it. Well, we can't ask the teachers directly, they will not tell us, but we can take a peek at what teachers are doing. We can see now what teachers are focusing on. And 60% of the most popular lessons, which became really popular,
That's something that's really interesting, that uh, children are attracted to. And those are the tasks uh, the, or the problems to introduce a topic. That is, when we study, when we start a new topic, we should really raise the interest of children. And we can see that most of those things are not based on what we had in textbooks before. For example, one teacher prepared a presentation at biology lessons. So she is going to discuss the theme of the hearing with children, how a human ear works. Uh, and she uses experiments with the waves of uh, cladmium. That's a vibrating string in the center of a metal disc, and there is sand in the disc. So when studying this physical experiment, which was not there in the textbooks, the teacher can model the emergence of sound, and after that the teacher can start talking about uh, how a human ear is designed. So teachers can invent something new which is not present in the textbooks. And in the big data environment, we still see those challenges that teachers are facing. Talking about mathematics, we are worried about uh, too much literal understanding of mathematical realities. Let's speak about uh, the geometry. The topic is rays. And uh, the teacher asks uh, the children, who saw a ray something? And somebody says, I saw uh, rays from my beacon, rays of sun. There is, uh, uh, There are rays of light coming from a torchlight. And as a result, we understand uh, uh, the real physical rays, but we don't understand the mathematical rays or half lines. So, and uh, children can't really grasp uh, the meaning of mathematical objects. Let's take another example, not from mathematics. The topic is uh, ancient Russian alphabet. It's very popular, children learn where it comes from. And then the teacher says, now we will divide uh, this alphabet into puzzles and we will combine those puzzles together. And for 15 minutes, children combine together those puzzles. And then we ask the teacher, would anything change if you allowed uh, the children to just play with their mobile phones for 15 minutes. Would anything change? And the teacher has to acknowledge, no, nothing would change. So actually, it's just uh, wasting the children's time without uh, really making them learn anything. So we can now analyze what really happens with a more or less approximation. And then, we will have to understand uh, how the teachers could cooperate with each other and develop recommendations uh, with the materials available at lessons and not the materials that we just invented uh, in our closed community. Just to add uh, to what Igor has said, I remember the time when we had experiments in a real class, those experiments uh, were guided by Vasily Davidov, an outstanding educational psychologist. And I remember him talk about how difficult it is to understand what each particular child is doing in the classroom. We asked uh, the children to work as much as we as uh, they could 
with some drafts, with rough copies. And I believe that uh, psychologists of mathematical education are now having great possibilities of analyzing how children behave in a digital environment. And then we will have this possibility of answering the real problem mentioned by Natasha, that is helping children with that have difficulties. There are millions of books or articles about those children, but right now we have materials of uh, much greater quality. And I would like to add one more fine thing. I think it's pretty important, though. And there's a provocative issue. But if we talk about uh, people who work with children in different roles, I talk about parents, teachers, scientists, researchers. There are a lot uh, of biases there. For example, teachers do not like uh, methodologists because methodologists are harassing them with pointless reports and give uh, too little practical recommendations. But actually, those uh, method methodologists or supervisors uh, are really needed. Maybe there should be experienced teachers who help young teachers because uh, sometimes young teachers need advice and parents and teachers do not like psychologists. I apologize uh, in front of those who are here because there are many people who as psychologists approached parents or teachers pretending to have some sacred knowledge and universal recipes and knowing what's right. And uh, the others don't always like those psychologists. So one of our obvious goals is to destroy those barriers, bring them down, not because we do know everything, because right now we have a huge uncertainty. But if we become friends with each other, if we really work together, then children and parents will get very helpful advice from psychologists, from scientists in mathematics education. And in Russia, it's always uh, the mathematics scientists uh, who paid great attention to mathematics education because uh, real scientists also work uh, in schools in Russia. So let's work for the benefit of each particular child and teacher. There have been a few new words about psychologists, but psychologists uh, are always uh, for cooperation and friendship between teachers and students. And uh, um, as for school psychologists, uh, there's one psychologist for two schools and one psychologist uh, for three kindergartens in Russia. And we understand that not everyone occupying this uh, job has uh, an appropriate education and uh, sometimes uh, even uh, a PE teacher, a very good PE teacher became uh, a bad school psychologist. So we need to have more professional psychologists uh, in our schools and we have uh, a lot of uh, important problems uh, right now, such as uh, the relationship between the parents and the children. But uh, first of all, it's about the academic progress of a child at school and about consulting children and parents and teachers. That's what psychologists should do. And it's an important issue, an important part of their job. Uh, regarding mathematics, Actually, there has been a conference of uh, mathematics teachers, and there I said that mathematics is the foundation for the entire cognitive development, and we all understand that. Because uh, it's mathematics that helps us learn more about other sciences. We start understanding numbers, 
So it's a, a paramount subject. But the important thing is that mathematics itself is the first thing to give us problems because in languages we have exercises and exercises and on and on, but uh, getting this uh, competence uh, of uh, learning problems arises from mathematics. Let's look at international research. In most cases, in terms of skills and competences, uh, Russia is ahead of other countries. But uh, when we talk about practical skills and competences, it's very different. We are lagging behind. And maybe we are lagging behind because we do not take into account the potential of mathematics for developing all the cognitive abilities uh, that help you learn other subjects. And it's not without about cognitive abilities alone because there should be emotions and well and motivation. So all this uh, pretty humanitarian world should uh, also be something that the child understands because it's not just about memory and mind but uh, emotions are also important. Uh, human communication is paramount. This part should not be forgotten. So when we run after cognitive abilities, we should not forget about em emotions. Sorry for this digression. Well, actually, this was a great summary of our conversation. We are supposed to stop right now. <clears throat> Thank you very much, dear colleagues. And now we are going to move on to a more hands-on part of our conference. I hope uh, that you really liked it and have a great day.